be aware that um, this is Paris and all that waits between me and you is, uh, and lunch is me. Um, so I, I will try and, and be sharp and crisp. But I would ask that you mentally agile with me because I think what we've had this morning is an extraordinary array of points of departure. Um, and both in disciplinary terms but also in geographical terms. And I'm going to change that register again and speak from the southern tip of Africa, uh, that's Cape Town, uh, where although I'm not speaking about African cities, um, it's very much the register and the place from which I come. And really the question that I want to ask us is, what is the future of urban welfare given the very massive and dramatic demographic change that has taken place globally? And this is a really important, I think, um, Diagram. It's quite busy, so let me just work you through it. That's population, global population, which could really say seven on the left axis. Uh, time over there. The really important big triangle that we're talking about, which is the growth of the number of urban residents uh, in the cities of the emerging economies, which I think is going to change the face of almost everything as we know it. Uh, relative to a rural population, relative to the cities um, in the global north. And I think the difficulty for us is that if you contemplate what incredibly interesting things there are that are happening in the developed world at the moment, where there are these massive ruptures, these incredibly important shifts that are taking place, and how incredibly interesting those are, and how many people there are who know something about them, and therefore what a fruitful dialogue it is, it's very difficult to concentrate your brain on the stuff that's going on on the left-hand side of the page, where the dialogue is very diffuse, there are not particularly interesting intellectual ideas out there, there are not that many people, and the evidence is actually very weak. And yet, if you have a look and you say, so what should we be thinking about? It's actually fairly unambiguous. Um, and so it's a very difficult moment, I think, for us. And I think part of that, that difficulty is that we don't have a way of talking about questions like welfare in the global south. And so that's what I'm trying to do. It's a, this is a paper that's sort of, it's not yet a paper, in fact it's just advancing or some other work uh, that I have been doing in a series of talks I've been giving in London. But what I really appreciated about this discussion, Tom, and, and others was this notion of focusing the brain on, on what welfare specifically meant. And I've started off simply for myself, of trying to actually be specific about what it is that we understand welfare to be. Because of course it takes place across a range of, of different scales, national policies, really important. Okay, so whether or not you get a pension, um, you know, you, you, you've just said your final point, is such an important one. You know, when you're focusing your brain on, in, in public policy debates around the state of the future of pensions, child grants, any number of other kinds of grants, some of these other issues which may appear to be smaller, less important, are quite difficult to access. And yet, in a way, they're the everyday politics of welfare provision, which in places which have had welfare regimes have come to be so accepted that we don't actually recognize them as such. And so one of the things I was trying to do was simply to surface what, it, what do we mean when we talk about welfare. And I thought it was also useful in a way, particularly, and there are not that many people here who come out of the development community, to be very explicit about what welfare is not. Okay, and, and this is a much more provocative point than most of you will read it uh, as being, because what I'm actually saying is welfare is not about livelihoods. If you look at almost all of the literature that comes out of the global south, it's a debate about how the poor can help themselves, the assertion that what poor people do for themselves is really, really significant. All of which is true. But what I'm saying here is not about that. I'm not talking about how greater effort on behalf of the poor, perhaps the withdrawal of the state in areas where they intervene in the lives of the poor, will advance their livelihoods. What we're talking about here is also not what the poor are forced to pay vigilante groups. In other words, the systems on which they depend, as opposed to systems which advance their well-being. Um, and that last slide seems to have run over. I'm also not talking about the kind of, of participatory processes that have no systematic change. In other words, a lot of the literature on the global south has been about 
how important it is to engage people about participatory processes, and sometimes the Porto Alegre example is one that's always rolled out, there are some budgetary changes. What I'm trying to talk about here is a much wider scale, scaled up if you like, set of interventions that affect populations as a whole. So if we were to go back to those very big numbers, the billion people that we're trying to reach as opposed to the individual households in an individual favela or an individual slum. It's at scale that I'm trying to have this conversation. And that might seem an a, a difficult uh, thing to be asking, and particularly if you, Kevin, if you can read that slide right at the bottom. It's, for me, it's a, it's a very, very confrontational slide. It comes from David Satterthwaite, the, the figures, and what they're showing are the numbers of countries where in urban areas, and that includes places like Nigeria, like Ethiopia, these are not small countries, yeah? where less than the 20% of the population has water piped to the house. Okay. It, this, is, this is some of what the baseline is that we're talking about. And in that context, it may seem strange to you to be saying, actually, there's a really critical agenda about urban welfare, particularly in the global south. And yet, I would posit to you, and some of us were having a very interesting discussion earlier, that places like Luanda and Mozambique how people are beginning to start thinking about how services should be provided, the embryonic forms of service management are absolutely crucial. Okay? Because if you set up, as in the case of Luanda, an utterly privatized, utterly self-contained elite system, it's very difficult later on, as we know from other colonial contexts, to begin to start incorporating people in other ways. So even though clearly a welfare regime in somewhere like Luanda is a long way off, nonetheless, the framing of the problem, the framing of the systems, the technology choices which are made seem to me to be really critical. I think though, and this I think Kim, I really enjoyed your paper in Latin America because I think it's such an important place for us to, to be thinking about. Actually, if we think about what's really going on in the world, in the world now, and this seems insensitive in the context of Europe to say, I'm very sorry for your woes, but actually Greece and Spain are not the big stories of the day. Huh? It may be what the economist is carrying, but it's not the big story of the day. The big story of the day is growth. It's growth in Brazil, it's growth in China, it's growth in India, it's growth in a whole lot of places. And so the point that I'm making here is so the dark blue is the share of GDP from OECD countries in 2000, and look how quickly that shifts. The world as we know it is changing rapidly, incredibly, incredibly rapidly. And what that means, and the corporates all over this, okay, you, you, you pick up a Monitor magazine, you pick up anything from the big corporates, they're all over, where's the new middle class? But it seems to me that on the left, we've been very, very slow in recognizing that the cities of the South are simultaneously the sites of struggle for both welfare and capitalist accumulation. Okay? And so the challenge of the day, it seems to me, is for us to begin to start articulating what this means in the context of the global south. And we know that here the stories are very different. We heard it again this morning, and, and, and you know, actually the neoliberal narrative isn't the most useful necessarily. There are stories of, whether it's in Mexico, whether it's in a whole range of places, of massive expansion of welfare reform. And even in China, where we had that very contradictory uh, case that Fulong was painting for us today, of both the retreat of the state, but also the extensive engagement with the state of a new kind of distribution. And so yes, this notion that wealthy both shapes inequality uh, and also ameliorates it. So it seems to me that one of the difficulties and one of the big debates is, is there a distinctive pattern of Southern exclusion? And, and maybe it's useful and maybe it's not. It's like, is there a Latin American city? Yes and no, um, which we need to be talking about. But that column, that graph on the right hand side, I think you will find really useful. It's the yellow and the orange represent the rate of urban change. Okay? Um, and it is impossible in the context of a demographic transition of this magnitude for us not to begin asking questions about city scale dynamics. In other words, what we've got is not just a movement from the countryside into the town, but also a movement into other parts of the world. And one would hope in that context, that we back to the very first graph where I tried to say, so what is urban welfare? That we might begin to start thinking creatively and openly uh, about those processes. And so 
I'm playing here. Uh, forgive me if this is in the embryonic age of, of thinking. Um, but it does seem to me, and this, this follows, I think, very nicely from some of our discussion yesterday, um, <laughs> that <coughs> what we have typically done is to have, if you look at almost all of the urban literature, it positions the stuff of, of, of state, whether it's national or local, versus civil society as the axis. Uh, and if you get into the discussion we were having earlier, perhaps there's a debate about what kind of state. Okay. Is this a state that's a reformist state or a repressive state? Is it the maternal or the, the not maternal state? Whereas in fact, when we go into almost all of the cities of the global south, what we find is that states are weak. And quite often civil society is quite weak. Okay. And that the important actors, which are the ones about which we know very little, are non-state actors, like traditional authorities, like royalty, okay, people whose elites we don't understand particularly well, or they are uncivil societies like gangs. And it seems to me that what is really interesting is that, at least in most cities of the global south, it's the interaction of these four different domains, and there may be others, that becomes really important as an outcome. And Vanessa Watson's notion of, of conflicting rationalities, I think, is really important here. Because they don't see the world in the same way, they have very different interests which they serve. Their legitimacy is fundamentally different in, quarter, in, in different kinds of respects. So, of course, there are very different questions around, you know, actually what you're able to do in Nigeria where you have relatively large resources relative to what you're able to do uh, in a very much poorer country like Mozambique uh, are going to be very different. Um, but it's mediating some of those tensions that we want uh, to be able to do. And it's in that context that I'm basically making the argument of let's think about welfare at the urban scale. The problem with that is, and I've just got three quick problems as we begin to embark on that, is that actually we don't know what the hell the urban scale is. Okay, particularly in places like Africa, it's really not clear. Okay? Lots of people move in and out, the numbers are absolutely appalling. We don't know how many people there are, let alone how many live in urban areas, let alone what size of household there is, let alone what percentage of people can or cannot afford to pay. We just don't know. Okay? So we're talking about initiating a set of, of, of public policy initiatives in the context of a dearth of information. And we also have very weak local government boundaries, we have very, those competing spheres of power. So, Maybe, maybe this is too difficult. Maybe we shouldn't go over there. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to face a lot of resistance because actually there are a whole lot of players there already. Okay, it's not like people don't consume water. They do. They buy them from water from at great cost from vendors. They depend for such a protection, crime prevention on gangs. There are a whole lot of people who are present in this domain who are really not very interested in a developmental welfareist set of interventions. And you're going to have to take some of those processes into account. It's also not clear that everybody in the intellectual community from which we are uh, participating agrees that more state involvement is a good idea. And we've heard a little bit about those kinds of things, like the way that states mess up uh, in, in our presentations here. And it's a scan of the literature, you could have done it on a number of other literatures, but there certainly are people who make the argument that states do more damage than they do good, that actually an absent state is better than an interfering state, less government is good for the poor. A lot of people are saying, you know, whoa, Africa works, is the famous uh, title of the book uh, by Cheval. And it's not clear that the kinds of states that are necessary to provide the sort of welfare that we're talking about it, exist. And yet I, and that, I still want to make the plea that we put the stuff on the table. And the reason for that is very simple. Is that without universal coverage, okay, without what might amount to the notion of a modern welfare state, you have ad hoc targeting, it depends on clientism, it depends on donor fatigue, donor fashion. The poor themselves land up disproportionately helping each other out. You can, and that's the, the, the outcome of, of, of the livelihoods uh, perspective. The benefits are allocated not on the basis of need, but on the basis of some kind of in-group clientelist uh, gathering. And there's no city-wide kind of provision, and you will never build a city where there is any kind of public good. And so, although I think this is an enormously difficult task, 
it does seem to me to be one that we have to be putting on to the intellectual agenda. And we need to be reshaping our thinking in order to be able to do that, because it requires a very different intellectual project from the one that we are comfortable with. The one we are comfortable with is one which says, look how badly this is being done. Look what the unintended consequences of this are. Look how incredibly negative these impacts are. And what I'm suggesting here is we have to reframe that to start saying, if you had to put forward an agenda, how would you begin to think about it? What would be necessary to be done? And what are the implications for it? And it seems to me, and it's in that vein of that moment of discussion that we began to start having yesterday, that if you do want to begin to start making a difference, I would position that actually a universal system is about the only place from which to begin. And that takes us back for all of its dramas and its faults to some ideas about modernity. And it's that universal idea of a single tax system which enables you to redistribute a single universal system so it doesn't matter whether you were born black, white, male, female, you're guaranteed of some notion of minimum. A single land market, not one where you get trapped, where you cannot actually uh, get into alternative systems and you have some other points there and uh, we can do that. And that means that we need to bring back the state as a site of struggle. Okay, so it changes the orientation of a lot of the developmental literature. It challenges quite a lot of left thinking where the state is actually seen as a site of capitalist accumulation and of capitalist interests. And it frames the state as actually a place where we actually need to wage an ongoing struggle. And in that context, it seems to me we have to start asking, and this is I'm beginning to wonder, um, what are some practical sorts of things that that might mean? And so I try to think about what is it that states do that contribute to welfare? Okay, because it's this is not an abstract discussion. This is a very real discussion about what one may or may not actually engage in. And those are all a series of things. And I wanted to just highlight taxation, borrowing, spending, and redistribution because implicitly I'm saying those are good places to start. Okay, if we started there, and, and the premise of that is, and I can show you exactly where I live in Cape Town. And I made this point to Fulong, I think, before, is that I think what characterizes the middle classes of the global south is that they need extraordinarily privileged lives, for which they pay almost no taxation, mm -hmm. and which they engage yeah. in very little redistribution. Mm -hmm. And so it's that personal reflection that I'm putting forward as the basis for saying, can we actually think about this as a point of departure? And when we start to think about what states spend money on, this is the stuff on value capture, we know this well, we've, we've got a toolkit, we can begin to start thinking about it. Where states spend money on what they spend money on has significant impact on cities everywhere, but it has very real impact if where they spend is intended to privilege <coughs> rather than prejudice poor neighborhoods. That's simultaneously true depending on whether they spend money on roads for public transportation or whether they spend money on a public transport system. In other words, those big budget items, the things which gobble up the 25 million, and one might argue the same stuff, in the context of a U.S. city, is what states, states have money, okay? They make explicit choices about what to spend on, and we need to begin to start interrogating and engaging and following through. So Sonia's paper I thought was really interesting because it reflects what generations of state expenditure and the choices that have been made have material consequences. Uh, and they're going to have even more material consequences of a very low base in the context of cities of the South. Um, we also need to ask questions about where money comes from. So how do we borrow? And one of the things which has been absolutely extraordinary to me, it's a technical discussion, and we've tended to sort of cede it to those dreadful financial economists and business management types. But whether something is packaged in a way that actually has long-term positive implications, whether we distribute an element to it, or whether it is simply structured in a way to privilege banks, seems to me to be really important. And in this regard, I think the, le the left has been particularly negligent because all we've done is to focus on cuts. What we haven't done is to focus on where money comes from, how it is structured, how it is packaged, and how it is implemented. And I think if you think about how few people predicted the subprime crisis and what its ramifications would be in terms of urban poverty, we do have to ask where the academic community was and what it was that we were studying. Where were we? And I suppose I'm saying the same thing. If you think about those cities that we're talking about here, these are the cities that are only half built. When people look back in 100 years from now, mm -hmm. whose ideas informed the construction of the city in particular kinds of ways? And that seems to me uh, to be the case.
And so it's this issue of tax, um, very much in the news in particular kinds of ways that I'm wanting us to talk about. And ironically, I think this is where the so-called development community is particularly at fault, because, and the donor community, because typically what you would see is a country like Sweden or um, the UK and through their development agencies saying we only focus on low-income countries, we only focus on questions of poverty. And yet I think what the welfare frame does is that it brings in questions of redistribution, it brings in questions of inequality, and it frames that discussion in ways which say, not just how is inequality produced, which I think we need to know much more about, but also how is inequality ameliorated in particular kinds of ways. And so understanding why it is that cities have so little control over taxation, cities where wealth is concentrated, yeah? have very, very little control over their tax base. And that's particularly true in Africa, and we know why that is. There's almost no country in Africa, all 54 of them, where there is an explicit urbanization strategy. And that's because traditional elites hold on to national power and appropriate urban surplus. The days of urban bias that Michael Lipton put forward are long gone. So we have to begin to start reconfiguring uh, and recalibrating that. And it seems to me that the question of taxation and by implication the opportunity uh, for redistribution. But that means you need a state that is strong enough to prosecute the rich. It means you need a state that is strong enough to extract taxation from the rich. And that means that actually we need to focus. And again, I think this is an uncomfortable thing for many people on the left, on building the state as a site of struggle. And so, <coughs> in that context, it seems to me that we need to take some normative positions. And the one is counter to what is in some of the current literature, which almost embraces books work, for example, almost embraces notions of informality. Actually, you cannot have informality and redistribution. They are mutually exclusive. Okay? The state has to be able to see you, tax you, it has to be able to take money from you, see the recipient that it is targeting, and deliver those resources. It implies a very different universe from one where informality rules. And similarly, uh, those ideas about we actually do have to resist those private gated communities, not necessarily because we think that they're culturally abhorrent because of all the reasons of, you know, you have no cultural contact, but because of a fiscal reason. We need that money to redistribute. And in fact, if you look at almost all of the development charges, and I'd be fascinated to see some of the ones in China, certainly the, the South African cases that I'm familiar with, what in fact you discover is that what the state is charging developers to produce private communities does not pay for those communities' long-term infrastructure investment, i.e. the state is subsidizing those interventions. And it's exactly that kind of transparency that it seems to me we need to be exposing uh, in our academic work. And I'm going to leave it there. Analysis of the stuff on the sheet, the urban welfare. So, <laughs> please, any question? Because I probably this piece of... Oh, okay. Yeah. The design of urban welfare is very nice, but you know there is some resistance. There is some? Resistance. Really? You analyze partly, but not all. You argue you have <coughs> a state to organize the local welfare. Because state organize a social circle, it gives the rules between tax and the distribution. So what you need to refine is the way urban demands, urban contribution, makes the pressure in the global game. I study some developing countries like Thailand. There's a demand for minimum salary, some health policy. You could say in the first approach, urban middle class are arguing and poor class for more welfare. So you could say the reasons from the rural side. So the game is not only local urban welfare and state cohesion policy, it's also how the urban consider the game of power because they consider the city are taking a lot from farming surplus. So the balance of power between rural and urban so the equation is more complex. So in terms of operative variable, you have to put the, the farming facing the city. 
the balance between rural and urban, and in which the two sides are arguing for welfare. Uh, now this is a really important question. The, I don't know how much people follow. The, it's the question of whether it's urban welfare or rural welfare. And I mean, in some senses, it's not either or. Yeah? And I think that the, the real difficulty that we face is if you have a look at the demographic numbers. Uh, this is growing urban population. I don't really have the figures that we need. Imagine that what we have is a, a population that is growing quite dramatically those numbers. We also know that it's a population that is urbanizing. Okay, and it's urbanizing for two reasons. One, people are moving from the countryside into the town. But all the evidence is that actually the most important driver of growth is the natural expansion of the urban population. Okay. That, 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 that evidence is unambiguous. Okay. What that means is that you've got a very difficult situation where you've probably got the same amount of money maybe less, you've got a bigger population, and the population has shifted. Okay. Plus, you also have a set of old development priorities, which were very heavily biased to rural areas, because that's where rural, rural poverty, we know, has always been deeper and wider. That is no longer true, and implicit in that is the idea, and it's a terribly difficult decision to make, that you have to take some of those limited resources away from rural areas to address urban areas. It's like having a sick child, and you've always had a sick child, and suddenly you have three more children. What do you do? Keep all the resources for the sick child, or do you move some of the resources to some of the others? So it's not an easy discussion. Um, but I do think it is one that we actually have to have. And I think many of the things which could be done, because it's such a difficult emotional decision, and for many people a very difficult political decision, we haven't even begun to start having it. One of the things which is changing, and it's very interesting, is as political parties begin to realize that their constituencies are now urban and not rural, I think things are changing. The Latin American example I think is really interesting in that regard. In Africa, that's not the case. Most political parties continue to believe that their constituencies are urban, I mean are rural. And so they will almost always bias their policies to rural areas. It may be erroneous, but the figures are so bad, and most of us think it is erroneous, and they're going to make some political mistakes um, as a result. But it's, it's, so I'm not negating what you're saying, but I am saying that we cannot assume that rural poverty can continue to receive the same amount of the allocations as it has historically. Mm -hmm. So, next please. Oh, okay. Got it. Oh, no. Please. Um, I'm Tanaki from the, uh, from the Faculty of Economics at the University in Japan, but I'm now in uh, subsequent SOAS in London. I do research in the Southeast Asia, and especially in Thailand also. And then there's like um, a lot of uh, similar issues in Southeast Asia. But, um, I found that they facing to the really difficult situation now. The two things are happening. One is that actually the many phenomena, how to say, the different things happening at the same time. For example, like aging already started before yeah. it's developed. Yeah. And then so, and then also like uh, labor issues, all this development economics yeah. said the informal economy disappear when it's developed. But in Thailand, the like large informal economy, but at the same time, all these white colors now informalized. And then, so it's really difficult when they tackle the, the well, when they want to, start the new welfare issues, but it's, they cannot just copy like Japan or whatever. And also the second thing is like um, the Bangkok as a global city, they have, the government have dilemma. If they want to keep this position, they want to invest more with the finance and then also the multinationals. So they talk about, okay, let's, how say, uh, let's, uh, let's get the lower tax and then deregulate, blah, blah, blah. But when they have to de-distribute for the domestic, you know, the, to the uh, poor people or rural area or even the, in the urban areas, they have to talk about, okay, let's get more tax, well, how to say, more, more, you know, the, the higher tax rates and then we have to get more like, money from the rich people. So it's kind of dilemma. And then at the moment, the government tend to choose multinationals, you know, to favor for the multinationals. 
so it's kind of a really difficult situation in Southeast Asia and also probably in China. Um, do you face a kind of similar things in the cities in Africa? I'm quite curious and interested. I think in you made you, you make the point very eloquently. I mean, mm -hmm. what 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 people who are running these cities face mm -hmm. are complex challenges mm -hmm. and rapid change of a kind that is unimaginable. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think that many of the councillors in some of these cities are not even literate, um, and you think about what that means, it just, it, I think, you, you know, yes is the answer. But that capacity question, and I, I have an anecdote which from the African Center for Cities where I'm, I'm based, where there's a big program on town planning in, um, in Africa. Uh, there are almost no town planners in the African context, um, nowhere near enough to, to go through, and they teach the British Town and Country Planning Act. That's the instrument that they're using to manage the complexity of what we're talking about. So, um, yeah, I mean, your, your point is very well, and, and that kind of, particularly in middle income countries, uh, where there are resources, but knowing what to do and how to make sensible interventions is extremely difficult. Um, very, very difficult. So. Thank you. I, I have uh, more time for your question. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.